This is the talk that Photo London have asked Shireen and I to do. So I'll just introduce Shireen. If you want to say hello to the camera. And hello, everyone. I'm Shireen Neshad, and really a great pleasure to be here having a conversation with Nick. Excellent. So I'm Nick Knight. I run showstudio.com, and I'm a uh, photographer and filmmaker, much like Shireen, in a way. So on that, on that little brief introduction, um, where should we start? With similarities, differences? Um, That's a good point to start. <laughs> yeah. So you transitioned a bit like I did, or am, from still image to film, which I must admit I find very difficult. Um, and most of my career, most of my life has been still image. And so what I've been trying to do with my imagery is reduce everything down to a moment. So you take a sequence of events and you reduce it down to a single moment. So right. if you want, it's a reductionist medium. When I started looking at film, I found that very hard, very hard to, to try and do that. And I sort of concluded, and I wonder if you share this, that film is the opposite medium to photography. Yes, I mean, I always thought about um, photography as like a, a poem yeah. and movie making as storytelling. Oh, okay. You know, I mean, I always feel like, and Nick, just remember that with my photography, I have no background. There's always like a blank background. Yeah. It's always about human portraiture. But came with the moving picture video and later more narrative film, uh, landscape came, choreography, yeah. music, um, you know, um, more theatrical, dramatic um, developments and really a beginning, middle and the end. And, and really... Um, I think the challenge of creating a single picture that says everything in that expression, which yeah. usually I reduce it to a human body, yeah. with hand and feet and face, versus you know a, a more spatial, um, experiential, um, you know, artwork that the audience is literally able to experience the idea in an expanded sense of time. Yeah. Yeah. So do you find any difficulty, or did you find any difficulty, moving from the still image to the moving image? You know, I, it's very interesting. When I look back at my videos, early videos, like yeah. Turbulent, Rapture, Fervor, yeah. they were literally compositions of my photograph that began to move. Right. Like, uh, really, yeah. the aesthetics, uh, you know, this... Um, kind of very rigid constructions, and um, because I think my images are very sculptural, you yeah. know? And, and I, I just saw that basically every frame of the videos became a photograph, yeah. but they were moving. So there was certainly the vision or the lens of a photographer. Yeah. But then that slowly changed as I became more seduced by cinema, right. where there was a really a protagonist, a character development, yeah. and mood making and production design, etc. But at the beginning, for me, it was like the pictures began to move. Right. And there was something really nice about that. Right, right. And did you feel any sense of um, losing control? Was there a kind of a moment where you felt, actually, the skills that I have innately to create a still image, do I have those skills or am I, to some degree, asking other people to do those, those skills for me? You have to understand the, the state of mind that I was in when I moved toward video was... I rebelled against my own signature of photography. Yeah. I, I absolutely disliked the fact that be, I was beginning to be identified as, oh, this woman who does black and white photograph and then she writes on it. And, yeah, yeah. you know, like it was like I was a tailor that making different sizes and different. Yeah. Uh, and it was just becoming so predictable. And so I, I, I sort of like rejected everything that I'd done. So for me, the opening of experimentation with the motion picture was like a whole new departure. Yeah. And, and so I was going to do everything against my own previous work. No calligraphy, no, and, and so, a and new partnership. Yeah. And, and so, I, it, you know, it really, when I started to experiment with the mo motion picture, then I wouldn't stop until another 10 years. Yeah. Then I went back to photography. Right. Uh, and so I think my... Uh, seduction with um, uh, with the motion picture was my feeling of restlessness and worrying about stagnation, you right. know, and and also just love to be a beginner. Yeah, 
I mean, I was, I, I, I went to art college, you would loaned to art college too, but throughout life one has different tutors that aren't necessarily um, from college. So um, I remember somebody who was very important to me, the, the French art director, Marc Ascoli, who was my tutor for fashion in a way when I came out of college. Um, I spent three years working for a Japanese designer called Yoji Yamamoto under the tutelage of Mark Ascoli. And one of the things that he taught me is to kill your darlings, which is a slightly vicious phrase. Uh, but I think it's the same thing. That once you've done something, the only way to progress is to go against or, or to kill off what you did before. So yeah, I and Nick, you have to remember that I never was educated in photography. I so never. What was your college? There was education? no loyalty. Um, I, yeah. I was a very bad painter, uh, <laughs> and I was lucky. I destroyed every evidence of my work in school, and I was very happy to just have a job and live in New York. Yeah. And art became an accident, you know. Yeah. And so I had, I had no, not this relationship to the medium of still photography or this romanticism, uh, I always worked with a photographer, mm. right? For me, it was more like a more conceptual approach. And, and um, to this day, I am not trained at anything I do. Mm. Um, like filmmaking, I'm doing an opera, yeah. or I'm you know, doing vi video. But I think there is something about embracing the unknown. Yeah. The risk that you take that I, I know, I mean, just talking with you, listening to what you have been up to, you remind me so much of myself. Because, oh, really? <laughs> because when you, you know, sort of cross borders, there is such a strong, you know, reality of failure yeah. or, or doing something that people will always compare with what you're really good at. And people say, oh, no, no, she's a good photographer, but she's not good at filmmaking or not good at... But the reality is that the refusal to be defined as, as one thing yeah. and the freedom for you to, to make fashion photography, which I think they're art as well, uh, and to do videos and, and, and to make films and to, to make this beautiful work that you're doing with flowers that have this painterly quality, your refusal to be defined as yeah. one type of artist. I think that's something that I have to say a lot of artists are not that comfortable with. Right. Both in respect to their market and the pressure of their dealers. And yeah. But I think we, we in, a, in a funny way, we're quite different. And in a funny way, we're very similar. I also came from a slightly um, left of field way into, into photography. Um, I didn't set out to be a photographer at all. I set out to be a doctor. Ah. Um, my mother who was a frustrated doctor because her father wouldn't allow her to be a doctor because it was unladylike. So you can tell how old my mother was and from what generation she came. My, father, my grandfather, who was a self-taught dentist, said to my mother, who wanted to be a doctor, you can't be a doctor, that's not for ladies. So I think she passed that frustration on to me. So I said to her, light is slowly going. Um, I, the, I set out on that career as a, to be a doctor and had no desire, no application, no, um, none of the sort of skill set to, to succeed at that. And somewhere, almost by mistake, I came across photography. Um, and so I went to art college after failing at university and being thrown out of university. Really? So the end, well, I did no work, Shereen. I so, you know, almost they were quite didn't right. graduate either. <laughs> <laughs> they were quite right to throw me out. I was, I was a disruptive influence and not doing any work. That's so amazing. they were quite good to get rid of me. I was quite... I think it was probably the right decision. So I went down to a little art college and started there, but with no prior knowledge of, of art, yeah. no prior knowledge of photography, really. Um, and very much like you, the first things I started doing was drawing on my photographs. So I would make a, take a photograph, then make a print of it, and then draw on it with black ink, and then make a negative print of that print, draw on a negative with black ink, so effectively drawing with white, make a reversal of that again in the dark room by contact printing again, and do that until there was no white, no gray, it was just white and just black. So those are my first works, and I didn't know whether I wanted to be Kurt Schwitters or Maholi Naji or who I wanted to be, I just wanted to create. And the college I was at sort of took one look at me and said, we think you should be in the graphics department, but oh, maybe not, maybe. If anyway, I was allowed to indulge whatever path I was in. So my first, my first entry into photography, in a way, I would ne never call it calligraphy because it wasn't of anything very beautiful. But I certainly painted on my photographs as a way of just 
finding some way of shaping the world around me uh, and my vision of it. I think that um, one other issue I think we have in common, because when I see your work, um, there's a lot of poetry and there's a lot of emotions. Right. And I, and I actually, we always just say women are the one who make emotional work and men don't. <laughs> but I think even in your fashion photography, I mean, when you have models, etc. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking a lot at the, the gazes of the yeah. people you photograph. And, and, and I think, um, there's your touch that I find extremely moving. And, okay. and that's hard to, to get when you're doing actually a job, you know? Uh-huh. And, and I think that, um, so I would say, you know, your relationship to human body, human portraiture is very much the same because, uh, as me, because at the beginning, Nick, I used to photograph myself. Right. Um, so the self-portrait were intended to me directing myself because I didn't think I could direct other people to convey similar emotions. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just couldn't even know how to express that. But slowly, um, I was, I, I look at the photographs I've taken of other people, particularly people who are not just friends, but people have real people that I've, like yeah. in the recent work at the Photo London yeah. in New Mexico. And I, I realized the, the power of, like, you can photograph human, human bodies endlessly, and they're always interesting. Mm. And, and every type of person is interesting. And, I totally agree. And I'm, I'm always very surprised. Occasionally, I see at a fashion magazine a portraiture of a beautiful model that you just think, that's going to be a superficial, like, just like a fashion. But it's just riveting. It really draws your attention and you feel like, wow, that's, yeah. that's pretty powerful. So uh, my question to you is yeah. this, um, how do you manage or handle this sort of boundary between, you know, the world that you serve, the fashion world, as well as your fine photography and where do you negotiate this boundary? Um, I guess it's because I don't see a boundary. Okay. Um, for me, every time I pick up a camera, it's with the same intention, yeah. trying to take the best picture I can possibly take. Um, any, any photograph I treat with the same, in the same respect, any uh, attempt to photograph I treat with the same respect, and the same desire to create the best image I can possibly create. Um, I've always loved fashion between you and I. I get, so I bring my mother into this, uh, but I think it came from my mother. My mother would change uh, her physical, uh, what she was wearing, five times a day. So she'd arrive at breakfast in one outfit. For 11 o'clock in the morning, she'd change again for coffee. <laughs> at lunchtime, she'd change. Middle of the afternoon, she'd change. High tea, she would change. So, my, so fashion was something that she clearly loved um, and indulged in. So she was actually thrilled when I didn't become a doctor and became a fashion photographer, but that took some years. Um, so I've always had a sort of innate love of fashion. I've always thought that fashion's a really important human code. Um, it's in a way the first thing we see about each other and it's a code we understand I read what you're wearing I read what Tom's wearing you know you, you understand what people the little messages we give off and sometimes playfully so I might wear a suit because I know what it represents but I'm wearing it playfully in a way because I enjoy that game um, so I think fashion's a, a, an interesting and important way for us to sort of make some sort of statement of who we are you sort of notice by the inverse of that, when people want to suppress a society, they suppress fashion. So, you know, obviously, um, in terms of, you know, if you look at a prison, everybody wears the same clothes. It's a way of taking away the individuality. So fashion is an important way, not the only way, but an important way for us to say, this is me. I yeah. do it. And there are very, very few societies ever that have not had some sort of way of adorning ourselves to show, you know, uh, sexual availability or political hierarchy or, you know, whatever it is. So people dress to say, you know, I'm a, a young man and not married or, you know, whatever it is. So there's, there's, I think it's something. That's like, so I, I think it's important as, as a cultural art form. Um, and also it's full of incredible people. Yeah. Some of the most interesting people I've ever yes. met have been from fashion. So Yoji Yamamoto is a Japanese designer. Absolutely. Um, Alexander McQueen, John Galliano. You know, there are people who who I've met yeah. and had the privilege to work with, who I guess... Masters. ...are absolute, you know, no, no question in my mind at all, incredibly important culturally for us. And fashion becomes a sort of 
way for society to show its aspirations. And it's a, it's a unique medium in the way that it's um, uh, a future predictive medium. Yeah. So it says to its viewers, this is what you'll want in six months' time. Yes. You don't want it now, but you want it in six months. This is what you want to be. So it sort of leads. There's a very negative side to that, and I absolutely say this with recognition that fashion is ne not necessarily all good, morally, for the planet. It's kind of elite, yeah. There's a whole bunch of, of difficult things. But it gets a lot of bad press. So I, I, because I also do believe in it, I think it's fair in some way to, to, to be aware of that, but also to try and defend its role in society and to defend its use. But I have met some of the most interesting people, and what it allows me to do is to work in collaboration. Mm -hmm. So in the same way that you might um, find a deep collaboration with a cinematographer or Absolutely. an actor, you find the same deep collaboration with a fashion model or a designer. A designer, So like yeah. Steve, uh, 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 Alexander McQueen. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I think a lot about artists who, who've um, been very... Um, original in terms of their style being part of their, an extension of their artwork, yeah. such as Frida Kahlo, yeah. Louise Nevelson. And it's very strange these days, like I have my own minor style, which is um, yeah. very minimal, but um, you know, like I, I feel like the way I do my eyes or the way I wear things in, in kind of, you know, it's kind of an Eastern, Western ideas meet, yeah. clash. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really a representation of my identity in terms of an Iranian and um, yeah. someone who's really fascinated with <coughs> certain aspects of the Islamic culture's beauty, sense of aesthetic, <coughs> fashion. At the same time, I'm obsessed with Western clothing, especially more minimal. And, but I find that in the art world, um, there is this absence of artists being like the way it used to be, where, mm. you know, artists were quite bohemian, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. And, and um, it's a novelty to meet artists these days where they, that there is some kind of a connection between their art and who, what they wear or how they, how their style. Yeah. And, and I think that's something for me has been obviously spontaneous, nothing I, but I look at Frida Kahlo and I, I look at her work and uh, it's just inseparable. Yeah. You know, what, Isn't you know, her political beliefs, her, her um, persistency about traditional values, you know, and, and the way also her sexuality, mm. you know, how that was all worn in the way she dressed and she presented herself in public, you know. Yeah. Don't they say that uh, you know, when you can see that an artist looks like their art is a, yes. is a, is a good moment? Um, and I think you're right. In, in a way, it's natural. Artists tend to want to try and understand the world by putting on their own understanding and showing their own understanding. And that must extend to how they present themselves, or often extends to how they present themselves, I would have thought. Because it would seem incongruous if it didn't. They have thoughts about everything. Artists can think about politics or love or, 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 or you know, whatever, the, the abstract or the, the hereafter or the spiritual, all a whole range of subjects. So they must therefore take in you know, every, every subject and you know, how their rooms look, where they, you know, what, what the, how they dress and, and, and all those things are part of their world, which would seem odd to me if they focused solely on their craft and exactly. didn't allow the rest of the world to fall to some degree. But I have to tell you something. Uh, I'm coming from Venice Film Festival that yeah. it has such an emphasis on red carpet and fashion. And, and, yeah. and I was, <clears throat> as the director of the film, one of the directors of the film, you know, I had to simultaneously um, be very focused in speaking about the film and being yeah. really articulate and yeah. um, defending the film, promoting the film, and 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 really um, being very serious about the content, which was very political in many yeah. ways, but also very visual, very artistic, and 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 at the same time, I had to think about how I look and 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 it's um, and, and you know, it, I always find that. Myself as someone who's crossing many things, for example, the Iranian media, the Iranian people, the art world, yeah. uh, the political sphere, the market, the film world. You yeah. know, I'm now dealing with the opera. 
I'm constantly having to change many hats. Uh, and sometimes it's very difficult to find that balance in terms of um, being in the right measure in all fronts. Yeah. Looking yeah. good, sounding articulate. <laughs> I, I, I just lose. And, and uh, making the film that is, is decent and you can speak highly about. So um, this is as a woman artist, mm. as an aging woman artist particularly, um, you know, it's a challenge to have to walk all these fronts. Even going from Venice Film Festival to Photo London, being known as a filmmaker yeah. to a yeah. photographer, and yeah. then totally, we talked a little bit about it, the change of audience. Yeah. Um, it, it is a, it is a, 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 Quite a, a shift. slightly destabilized thing. And it's one of, the, one of the things I was going to ask you in a, a sort of more broad question, is how much do you allow your audience to influence your work? You're being aware of what your audience demands, not demands from you, likes of you. Um, because when you said earlier on, in, in a way, you, know, you wanted to react against yourself, you wanted to, to stop doing one thing, doing something else, you will have accrued a, a set of people who love you for doing what you did before. Sometimes it can feel hard when you go against that because you get quite a hostile reaction from people. Who, Why aren't you doing the work you used to do? She's very good at that, and just she yeah. should just keep. You know, I, I think that um, it's not even that I'm very ambitious or I'm very good yeah. at many things, um, but I, I'm really terrified of repetition. Right. And I will never be one of those artists who could be a studio artist who could be just endlessly making photography or a video. Um, but there's something else. Um, I am Iranian, yeah. and the Iranian people who I'm very much connected to, even though I don't go there, yeah. um, they see my work um, through film. Right. Because they don't have access to museums and galleries. Yeah. And so far, the only work they've really seen is the movies I've made, like Women Without Men in 2009. Yeah. And, and so, and in terms of the content, I have to make work that is at once relevant to the Iranian people, but also the Western culture. Yeah. Because I am Iranian, very often there is in content something in nature that is Iranian, yeah. the main protagonist or whatever. So I'm serving two different you know, audiences, and um, but also um, there is this distinction between the availability of artwork that is made mostly as a commodity yeah. that is not really like videos are sold so they're not on the internet so I could make endlessly videos but nobody will really see them yeah. but if I make a video and people buy a ticket uh, or it would be on streaming yeah. they could see it yeah, yeah. now the difference is yeah. I would spend six years making that film yeah. I will never make money yeah. and it may never make it into the box office but there will be an audience for it. so there's a democracy in terms of making work that is more uh, mass friendly. Yeah. Where the artwork that is, um, if I could say, uh, is more reduced to a very specific, I could even say elite group of people who are mm. very educated in art and, and they're very informed and, mm. and then, you know, the, the contemporary art world and several galleries and auction houses and museums, yeah. but they're not necessarily open to like a larger group, although people do go see museums. So I, I think there's this activist in me who, who likes to, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, because my work is so political, that is yeah. not just seen by the art world, yeah. mm -hmm. but, but by my mother or by uh, people who are, who are not that well off. Yeah. Well, uh, but again, I think that's probably a similarity in our, our approach, um, but I do it in a slightly different uh, optic. Um, I didn't exhibit for 30 years, so I've actually had no exhibitions. It's only in the last three or four years, three years probably, um, through, first of all, an exhibition I was asked to do in Korea, uh, a retrospective, which I sort of didn't really want to do, but then actually really enjoyed doing, and then through our contact with our friend Michael G. Williams. Yes. Um, so I've started exhibiting now as a, as a way of showing my work, but prior to that, for, for 30 odd years, um, I didn't exhibit. My platform was the side of a bus or a billboard or back of a magazine. So nobody I was talking to had, um, had decided they wanted to see my work. They just happened to see it. And I quite liked that. I liked the fact that I wasn't talking to much when you say you, you would like to be democratic with your, with your voice um, and don't want to talk just to a sort of art audience. 
I also, slightly by default, slightly by choice, um, decided that actually I was quite comfortable with people seeing my work who knew nothing about me, nothing about the subject matter, nothing, and just to see if I could get through to them in that way. But it's a very difficult space to articulate through. If you imagine um, you, your, your picture is in the, in the front of Harrods, or a big department store yes. is in the window, the people who walk past that window yeah. are not, seeing, not thinking they're going to see your work. They are thinking they're going to go and pick up their bananas, or drop their child off to school, or go and buy a television, or they're driving a bus, or whatever it is. And you have to get through to them in that tiny to stop attention span their feet. to stop them to start to so tell them the story a and to let them finish the story in their own way. That's very, very interesting. So I, I like yeah. that challenge. Absolutely. The public versus the more private. Another thing I wanted to ask you, which is something I think a lot about, is I don't know why, but I'm taking always a lot of risk. Yeah. Uh, as I told you, I, I rebel against... Uh, what people like about me, like my work, you know, like if they like the photography, I move to video. The minute they like the video, yeah. I move to cinema. Um, but that notion that you're embracing something that you don't know what the end result might be, and in fact, you might really fail, and I have done that, where I've done many mediocre work, and I'm the first one to admit it. But I feel that I can claim that failure or, or learning to do better and worse work, mm. it's a part of an artistic practice and growth. Totally agree. And this pressure that, no, you can't do that because this is what you're better at, therefore don't touch that because it's something you don't know really about and you're too old to start new. You see, <laughs> who, that, who are these I, people I, I saying this to you? It's like, no, I mean, I think about Bergman. I mean, he did theater and cinema, and he was good at both of them until he died. But, I mean, the fact that as artists, I'm directing an opera. Yes, I'm scared, and no, I don't think this is going to be the best opera you've ever seen, but I can promise you one thing. It would be an original. Yeah. And it used to be artists doing multiple different things. So why now we have to be a painter, a still photographer or whatever? So I think for me it's like almost um, become a kind of resistance of yeah. uh, something against what we are told, especially yeah. once you become established, you yeah. Know? Yeah. what people like about you, mm. what people collect of you. Mm. Well, I, I think there's, there's a couple of really lovely things that you say in there. I think one of my pick up on is the word failure. Yeah. I think it's a very healthy part of our practice. I've I seen that. I've done that a lot. <laughs> so I think any, any artist has. Um, and certainly in photography, um, you are faced regularly. I've, I've said to you before we, we came on, on, on air that I'm um, working with Arthur Jaffer Monday, yeah. which is exciting. Great artist. And terrifying. Yeah. And I know the first time that I look through the camera and press the button and the picture will come out on the screen behind me, it won't be so good. It won't be the best picture that Arp has ever seen. It won't be my vision of him that I want to show him. And I will have to go through a, a slightly um, humiliating process of failing in front of somebody who I care about. Um, but don't forget that he often talks about... I don't know if you have listened to him, but he's gone through a lot of ups and downs and, yeah. and self-doubts. And yeah, yeah. Uh, he's had periods where depression, periods where he just was lost as an artist and then found his way. So I think what you need to... I, I always feel like the strength of artists are those who I love vulnerability, you mm. know? I, I don't like when I meet artists who are too confident. And I, I love people like Arthur Jaffa because... He talks about his history and development as an artist, and, and I think that his experiences and vulnerability as a human being, as an artist, shows. Yeah. 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 And I think what you need to do is capture, yeah. which is complex. Of course. But I think that um, he would be a great subject for a portrait, I think, and I'm, 
you're the best candidate and that's why he chose you. <laughs> so I have well, no doubt that you will. And I mean, I've often hired to pe do people's portraits, like I did Malala's yeah, portrait yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, actually this is a great ex example because she's been, Malala has been photographed millions of times yeah. and she always comes across as this super confident, you know, genius of a, art, a person who at such a young age is a prophecy of whatever yeah. as for young educational women. But I always wanted to say, well, no, I wanted to see what's under her skin, like yeah. as a woman coming to age and what did she worry about and what are her vulnerabilities? And so I really had to talk to her. Right. Because even when you talk to her, she's is an air of confidence and it's like, come on, let's, yeah. let's just also talk about being human, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and then it, I feel, honestly, I think... I got a good portrait of her. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I was very happy with yeah. that because uh, she let go. Yeah. But there is such a, I think she probably is so, um, she has to be strong. She has to be positive because she has had to the overcome pressure. such a huge trauma, which would absolutely. Yeah, the trauma you know, and the expectation, which is um, something that I have no idea what I would cope, how I would cope with it if I was her. No. Um, but I think also her humanity. Sometimes we forget about the fact that people that are put up on the pedestal at such a young age, yeah. how would they live up to that for the rest of their lives? Yeah, yeah. When can they be allowed to just be a human yeah. being? And I think Arthur Jaffa is a, truly a very accomplished artist at this moment, the artist of the moment. You know, I think what you need to do is just capture what you know about him, which is yeah. the real... Yeah. Real Arthur Jaffa, yeah. you know, not the superstar, not the yeah. rock. The thing star. I always find when you, I go into a photographic session um, is I still don't know how to do it. After doing it for 40 years, I still don't know how to take a good picture. You get nervous. I get very nervous. I'm <laughs> nervous too. now and it's in three days' time. So then I will spend the whole rest of the weekend calming my nerves down, calming my nerves down, trying not to let myself run, let my nerves get the better of me. And that's how that's happened in the past. Yeah. You said you did mediocre pictures, which I don't believe, but you said you oh, did mediocre, film, mediocre pictures. Oh, everything. Um, I did a, a mediocre picture of Robert De Niro. Oh, God. Which is not somebody you want to do a mediocre picture of. Um, and I, it was a, a, a funny situation. Uh, I don't know if you remember, there was a political magazine that started up in America in the 1990s, I think, called George Magazine. Yes. And, do you remember George? Yes, I do remember George. Run by the very lovely chap, John Kennedy, who I very much liked. Um, and he asked me to do a second cover of the magazine, which was of Robert De Niro. So he's trying to, so Robert, uh, John Kennedy's trying to promote um, the idea of George, George Washington. And so he wanted Robert De Niro to have a kind of George Washington wig and a ceremony, and actually George Washington's cere real ceremonial sword. So I'm thinking, okay, so I've got to do a portrait of Robert De Niro and he's going to be dressed as George Washington, okay. But Robert De Niro wanted to promote his film Casino. So he wanted to have a kind of sharp 50s suit and a kind of playing card. And it was just this kind of clash of different desires. And I'm looking at Robert De Niro through the camera and I'm thinking, I've got no idea where I'm to put you because you're like, you're two characters who don't meet. And, and he's the, very shy. He's very shy. Yeah. But I realized, well, for, for start, I, I got several phone calls before, as you know, sort of before the shoot, there's a certain amount of talking goes on. And I got a phone call first from John Kennedy, which is odd. Um, and then a phone call from Robert De Niro, which was odd. Um, and so I started to, to, unfortunately, to indulge my nerves, to allow myself to get excited and nervous. And so I was far too nervous when I entered into the session. And I looked through my camera, I looked, it was a Hasselblad, no, it was a 108. So I looked at the back of my 108 camera and I saw this face. And if you work with a 108 camera, you know that the back of it, everything looks so real. And I saw this face and I thought, the last time I looked into those eyes, he shot the person who was looking at him or stabbed them in the side of the head with a pencil or something horrific. And it's the same eyes as in Cape Fear, as in Taxi Driver, as in all of the films that he's been in, as these terrifying psychopathic characters. And suddenly you're looking at the very same person. So it didn't help calm me down. I'm sure the portrait is not as bad as you well, are talking about, but yeah, I have yeah, an experience well. to share with you. I was being photographed by Annie Libovitz once, oh. and she, um, she had all this mood book that when I entered, yeah. she told me, bring whatever you like, jewelry, whatever clothes, I got, yeah, yeah. got a whole bag. And, and so, and she had the whole wall covered with all these images that she wanted to 
make reference. Yeah. And it wasn't working. Yeah. And she did, she did. I didn't see what she photographed. She said she was not happy at all. I got a call and she wants me to go back. I went back and, you know, all my jewelry, my t- typical makeup slowly came down. Right. Uh, my makeup completely was cleaned out. My jewelry was down. My hair was down, which is, right. I always wear up. And she started um, looking at a George O'Keefe, a um, beautiful image of George O'Keefe. Anyway, she was very frustrated because yeah. she couldn't get from me what she wanted. Yeah. And um, and I, I, I felt for her because uh, at the end, I look at the picture and it's totally not me. Yeah. But it's her construction of what she wanted to, me to be. Yeah. But it's it's bizarre because I think... It's her artwork, but it's not me. And, and that whole thing about how much the photographer would turn you into what they want Basically. you to be. Yeah. And then how much do I fight to be who I am? Yeah. Uh, especially it was for, it was for a calendar. You know? yeah. and, and at the end, I don't think she was totally satisfied. I think she was quite frustrated. With, with, with other ladies, she was completely successful. I felt that the image was not one of my favorite, but I appreciated what she did. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think that um, it, it was really interesting as a photographer being photographed by another photographer and seeing the challenges that she had and really questioning the direction, you know. Do I capture who she is? Do I just make up what I want her to be? And at the end, she made me what she wanted to be. Yeah. But it wasn't, I wasn't so interesting. No, well, it's it's a funny thing that when you work with another photographer, um, as a photographer, it's a very strange feeling. I'm not very good at it. I'm not very good at having my have picture taken. Have people photographed you? I have been photographed, and I'm not very good at it. And I try and give. I try and, because I empathize. I hate with, to be with, photographed, with yeah. I don't hate it. I just never get the picture I'm hoping to get from it. Because <laughs> yeah. um, one has an image constructed of oneself <laughs> that when one sees the reality of the image, you think, oh, so that's not that then. Um, <laughs> But there's been a couple of times, and one particular time, with a young photographer called Tim Walker. Um, Tim's a lovely guy, very sweet man, uh, very nice. And I like his work, and so I was relaxed with him. And I kind of knew that he would do a good job. So I trusted him. So I allowed myself to to go with it. And um, he put some music on, so I danced. And I never dance. So I danced. I was moving around and dancing. And he got a really beautiful picture of me. That's amazing. But I wouldn't do that for anybody I didn't trust. I certainly wouldn't dance for anybody I didn't trust. Do you know that I don't even like to hear my voice? When I I feel like I like myself and I like what I'm saying. And then later, even this, when I watch it or if I listen to my voice, I so dislike my voice and the way I speak. So I think we are very critical of ourselves and how I think we have an idea about our image, what we want to be. And when we're really confronted with it on a picture or a video, yeah. we're like totally disappointed. But I think that's just human nature uh, and it's insecurity, but that's the way it goes. I, I think it's one of those things yeah. that, um, you know, I, I um, for better or for worse, spend a lot of time this side of the camera now. Yeah. Um, well, probably for the show studio. I'm looking at you and behind you, there's a picture of you and it looks like one of my artwork. Oh, really? It looks like a, well, a it, calligraphy. It looks <laughs> like a black and white. And, and I was thinking, my God, you know, it, it, I, I don't even know, is this something like a part of a tree? Or is this something is painted on somebody's face? Uh, it looks like it could be my eyeliner. It <laughs> looks like it's, it's, it's hard to define what it is. It's a very beautiful gentleman called Kubina, <gasps> who is perhaps very dark skinned. And I painted him with a one single brush stroke of paint. Amazing. It um, also could be like skin of a tree. Yeah, it's all the way, it's sort of flaking off and, uh, and, and raising away Love from him. That. But it's also the 10-8 it's camera. It's a mask, yeah. It's a 10 camera, which is a specific... I'm not particularly camera-focused, actually. Um, I don't particularly love cameras. Which we, we said, did I own a camera? Not really. Um, I have one camera, which is a 10 by 8 or 8 by 10 I think, they say, in America, um, which I have a certain affection for. I have a question from you. Yes. Have you ever done street photography? Yes. You have? Yes. It's where I started. Um, More like snapshots like, or like all very composed? I have a first project I did, Shrim, was back in the end of the 1970s. I photographed uh, in England at the time, uh, there were quite a few youth cults, so like gangs basically, but following certain sorts of fashion. And there was one British youth cult called Skinheads who have mutated into something less interesting than they were when they began. 
They began in the 1960s, very much as an inspiration from um, the um, influences that were coming across from, from uh, you know, the, the new black immigrants that were coming into the country from Jamaica. So very much sort of the rude boy culture, fused with a kind of British working class, rejection of middle class and upper class values. So an interesting kind of sociological mix. Um, and when I was a, a young boy, I very much, they were very much part of my life because I came back to Britain at the beginning of the 1970s from having lived in France. And um, first thing I did, I got beaten up by some skinheads. So oh, it had a kind of wow. big influence in my life. Um, wow. So that was a, a little, and then at school, of course, there were lots of, you know, and it was a whole kind of, it was British culture in the 1970s, which was a bit grim, if I'm truthful. British culture wasn't very flamboyant. It was a bit sort of a, a bit dowdy. Um, but very interesting because you had lots of these different youth cults happening. And I photo, I did a, my first thing I did was a, a series of photographs of skinheads, a particular gang of East London skinheads who I followed around. Um, Fascinating. And I was one of them, so I was party to this. Oh, wow. Um, and then I swapped allegiances and then started following around a gang of West London skinheads. There's a rivalry between East and West. Um, Love to see them. Well, that's one of them, the back of the right. head over I there. I see this beautiful so, image. Yeah. That was my, f my first thing into photography. I see. So that was my first thing. But it's one of those things, you photograph things. I did it because I loved the style. I loved the, uh, uh, if you want, the, 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 the um, provocation. Um, and I loved skinhead girls, if I'm truthful. Um, yeah. And I loved the music. So it was, for me, it was a kind of natural, these are things I love. And I felt yeah. it was at the point where I'd been thrown out of university um, and I wanted to do something. That I, and I, I had a rejection of my middle classness if I'm yeah. honest. Um, class in Britain is still very present, um, and the upper class are fine being the upper class, the working class are fine being the working class, the middle class don't want to be the middle class, they want to be upper class or lower class, so they, they do a sort of bit of class tourism, and I was going through exactly that. I didn't want to be the class I'm, um, I was, so I sort of, you know, so I wanted to, to be part of this sort of, you know, this world, and so I did a series of photographs of skinheads, that's the first thing I did with a Nikon um, and a little uh, Olympus Practica Super TL, which is a half frame camera, which you hold in one hand and wind on with your thumb, click, wind, and you put a flash on top of it, which means that you're, you know, you're, you're taking a picture without even looking through the camera. And so I would throw myself into the middle of fights in bars and stuff and just hope, just click. And there's a certain weird See, mentality yeah. that I don't know if you experience as well, but a totally false sense of security when you have yeah. a camera in your hand. So you're looking yeah. through a lens, you feel you're not part of it, you're watching it. So I'm in the middle of a fight and people are chucking chairs around yeah. or a bit scaffolding or yeah. whatever it would be. I, I thought it was fine. I thought I could just click away and I would not get hurt. And I didn't, by the grace of God, I didn't, um, I didn't get, uh, I didn't get uh, damaged. Um, came close, but didn't. So that was my first thing. So a bit of a, if you want, experiencing life. Because you know, I grew up, uh, uh, you know, my father was a diplomat in NATO, my mother was a physiotherapist in the end. Um, so I grew up in a kind of a very middle class environment. And of course, the only thing I wanted to do is experience the life I had not seen. So I threw myself into the gangs of East London and stuff and then West London. And you know, tried to see what people were about. And I met some very unsavory characters and people who had very, Have very Have you ever bad... exhibited this series? No. Oh, I did a little bit in Korea. Really it was part of, it. part of it. It's a politically, it's a dangerous thing to do. I see. Skinheads have become very, or are known for yeah. being very right wing now. I see. And have been adopted. Yeah. And it's not, I'm not right wing. I don't have an ideology that's coherent with that. Right. Back in the day, it was a youth cult. It was something yeah. you did as your way of looking at a particular way when you were growing up. Right. So you could have grown your hair long or you could have cut it short. It was a fashion. It's a fact, and that's probably where it should stay. However, it's been adopted as a lifestyle, adopted as a... As ideology. A ideology, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, which is quite conflicting because yeah. you can have very left-wing skinheads or very right-wing yeah. skinheads. It, it's, yeah. Life is like that. Yeah, I mean, often I think about um, what would it be like if I go... Because I have begun to act like a documentary fiction photographer no, by no. going to places like in Egypt and Azerbaijan and now New Mexico, where I actually photograph people that I brought to, let's say, a pizza parlor or hotel to photograph. Yeah. But I thought, what if I begin to think about incorporating land, you know, urban landscape, urban spaces, yeah. or, or like have a project where it's thematic, but it makes me go in more spontaneous nature of photography as opposed to, because like you, 
well, I wouldn't want to say about you, but I'm a real control freak. I even when I make a film, I edit it so carefully. Everything is just carefully put together. Oh. There's nothing spontaneous about it. Like, um, and and but I was thinking, you know, maybe I need to question my approach to photography and 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 really think about, you know, people on the street and. Not really composing them so much yeah. because I'm too much of a control. And mm. but when I work with average people, I just say, "Could you do some things with your hand?" And they do incredible things happen. And I thought, "What? What if I actually photograph people on the street?" I don't know. I've never done it before. Uh, I'm thinking about it, and um, this could be something that I'm not at all sure I would be ever good at. But I'm looking at a lot of artists who have been very good yeah, at it. That's fantastic street photography over the years. Yes, We're going right back to the 10th and the century. consistency of their vision is not just like in like one, but but let's say they have a single vision that somehow it's expanded through different images, and then you see ah, this the eye is um, you know like Mary Ellen Mark, you know, yeah, or the 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 poor in America, the portraits of the poor in America, yeah. or. Where you really see the, their housing as well as their their faces. I mean, millions of artists have done it. But anyway, I've never done that. I, I tell you something. Sorry to interrupt, but I tell you something before I lose my train of thought on it. Somebody I love, a street photographer, is not so well known. I don't think I might mispronounce his name, but I think it's pronounced Louis Farrar. He was a fifties photographer. I worked in fifties in early sixties, I think, in New York. Such a beautiful vision, and he gets what I think is in part of it. A, a, current theme which I see in your work, which is melancholy, um, and the idea oh. of loneliness, and the idea of the outsider. And I see that in his work, and it's some of the few work that I can see photographs that will reduce me to tears if I allow myself to go that way. His work shows people caught in this sort Sorry, of... Sorry, what is his name again? His name is Louis Farrar, but I bet you I'm pronouncing his name wrong. Louis Farrar, it's okay. F a u r e r, so something. It, it, yeah. And I'm also dyslexic, so I'm probably spelling it wrong. Yeah, yeah. So pronouncing it wrong. He's, uh, I'll, I'll send you a link to his, his work is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, but he captures, there's a picture he has of a man who probably has some mental health condition, I'm imagining, but I, one can't be sure, who's holding a little flower and he's standing on the edge of a street in New York in the 1950s. And you've got that kind of tough New York feeling going on around him, but he's just standing there. And you don't know what world is his in, but it's clearly not the world he's physically He doesn't know he's in. being photographed. Doesn't know he's being photographed. And he is clearly not in the same world in his head as the world you see around him. And there's another one of a beautiful little boy, about a sort of nine-year-old or um, ten-year-old, just holding himself like that. And he's got blonde hair, little striped top on. And it's in New York at night, and all the cars are shiny, and everything's hard. And you have this beautiful, tender moment. That this, I don't know what the expression means, but he's holding himself like that. If, if you don't know his work, or you're not familiar with his work, it's really worth checking out, because I think you would find some empathy in his vision. I don't know much about him. I know that he also worked weirdly a little bit in fashion. He's had some commissions um, for Bazaar or Vogue. Um, but his work is, is absolutely beautiful. Thing. I'm worried if I start researching other artists who do this kind of work, I'll be too influenced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, there's always a, but a I fine have line. To tell you, I had one incredible experience. The other day I went to Tate Modern, and they yeah. had exhibition of Rodin. Oh. And, oh my God, talking about emotions and talking about... Um, I, I was just blown over by um, this man's, like, his studies and even just the way he built the hands yeah, and yeah. the expressions, um, talking about melancholy and uh, emotional outbursts and even the kiss. It's just a remarkable, like, I, I've never seen in a, any sculptor this much expression of emotions. I, yeah. I, I was... I really was so touched. And you know what? I think maybe it was because they were not quite finished work. Yeah. So they showed more like a process as opposed yeah. to like very glazed, finished, shiny yeah. kind of. Uh, anyway, I, I was really moved by this exhibition. I don't know how we're doing with time. We're fine. I think we should probably look to wrap it up. Yeah. But, but, uh... um, but I just want to say that... Um, yeah, another thing about this gender thing that, you yeah. know, and I mean, we talked very much a lot about um, transi transitioning from mediums to photography to, yeah. you know, fashion photography to art photography to video to movies. Um, but also, I think it's very interesting to maybe talk a little bit about the male and female issue in terms of our business of working 
Um, and um, um, yeah, I think, do you feel like these days is, it is a real issue whether you're a male or a female artist in terms of being taken seriously? Or? Um, I would really hope not. Um, I don't have that much experience. In your business, are there a lot of female? The funny thing, um, well, the funny thing, the, 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 the thing that I've realized um, through doing show studio and, and looking into fashion film as a medium, fashion photography historically has had many less female fashion photographers. Annie Leibovitz has been one. Annie Le- yeah. Leibovitz, um, uh, Deborah Turville, um, you know, you got Louise Dahl Wolf, you can trace yeah. it back. Um, but you're looking at 80% male dominated medium. Um, with fashion and film, it's almost the reverse. It's almost uh, all the new young fashion filmmakers, directors that I'm seeing, because we get sent submissions to show studio every day. Somebody sends us a new film um, to look at, and it's very, very high percentage of female directors, which is really lovely to see. A bit quite strange that it should be that that distinct. Um, but I don't notice enormously within the sort of stills medium um, that there's a sort of predomination, uh, there's a change. I think that the way our technology is going and the way it's shaping what we do and the way it's allowing us as artists to do different things um, is so fast now, so much choice, so many ways of doing things, in a good way. Um, I wanted to talk to you very briefly, and I'll, I'll try and keep the subjects linked, about artificial intelligence. Um, because it is something which is huge and also very much already part of our lives um, and will become increasingly, increasingly. And I notice a a sort of almost a lack of response. I know Marina Branovac is looking at 3D scanning. Um, I know there is this, but very little from the the creative world of really engaging with this. And what worries me, Shrin, is this is going to be a huge force within our culture if not an overriding force in our culture. And I think one can either go, it's horrible, not for us, but then we're burying our heads in the sand. Then I think we, you know, it's, it's up to people like us to try and look at this, work with it, shape it, try and in some way use it. Absolutely. Um, it partly is because something it learns from, from experience. So an AI will learn from a data set. It depends who's providing that data set. Um, so I think it's really, we, we yeah. in a way, have a, a, it's really important for the artistic community or the artistic um, part of the world, if you want, to be part of this. My fear is otherwise it's the military and it's fine, it's big business. And I don't want my world shaped by people who want to get money from killing. You know, that's not my idea yeah. of the future. So I think it's so important for artists to in, engage in this new technology, however alienating it might feel. I do think it's really important. I totally agree. I totally agree. And I think our time must be up. Yes. Um, but I just say, I think we can go on for hours to talk yep, with each other. <laughs> yes. uh, and it's really interesting, uh, Nick, that we live in two different countries, different cities, different environments. And I think this is the second time I've come to London to spend time with you. And it's really a pleasure and well, likewise. to find so much to talk about and share, really. And you were so kind to lend us your studio. Last time we, we photographed Malola at your studio, so I consider you a family here oh, well, in London. I'm very, I'm very pleased and you do. thank you That's for kind. engaging in this conversation. I personally really enjoyed it. Same. And I can't wait to see what you're doing next. Excellent. Well, neither can I when I find it. <laughs> thank you, Shirin. Thank you so much.